How's it going, guys? My name is Zach with the movie Castle, and today we're going to be talking about The Curse of Frankenstein from 1957. This is Hammer Films' first Frankenstein film, and actually um, predates the horror of Dracula by one year, so this is actually the, the first big one. I thought it was uh, Dracula, but uh, this is actually before that. Um, Hammer Films, so wild guess as to who directed it. Of course, uh, Hammer director legend Terrence Fisher directed this. Uh, it stars Peter Cushing as Dr. Frankenstein and Christopher Lee as Frankenstein's monster. Uh, you do also get Robert Urquhart and Hazel Court as the female lead. Hazel Court, you might remember from another Hammer film we reviewed, the Man Who Could Cheat Death, where she was also the uh, the female lead in that. So one of Hammer's reoccurring female leads there. Um, jump right into the plot. Uh, no spoilers, but I want to talk about certain plot points, and I want to make you sure you guys have a basic understanding of uh, what happens in this movie. Uh, it starts off with a unique framing mechanism. Uh, Dr. Frankenstein, uh, Peter Cushing is in uh, prison and he sends for this priest to talk to because at this point the priest is the only one who will listen to him and he begins to tell his story about how he wound up in this predicament and that all begins when he was a young boy about 10 years old. You see in this version of the film uh, at, uh, at that age Dr. Frankenstein has become an orphan. Well, he obviously wasn't a doctor yet, uh, but Frankenstein's an orphan. His mother just died, and his father had died a few years back, and he is now the Baron, Baron Frankenstein, and he is the sole heir to the giant Frankenstein family fortune. So what is the first thing he spends this money on? Well, he decides to hire himself a tutor, uh, Paul, to teach him science. And Paul's a, a new character just for this movie, and it's a really good addition. You gotta love when Hammer tries something new and does a little bit of a experimentation. You already had the Universal uh, versions of all these movies, and they've all already been adapted really good. So if you have one good adaptation, why not do some experiments with the source material? Throw in a new character, a new plot element. Um, and yeah, Paul is completely original. So Paul tutors young Frankenstein, and they say within two years, Paul's taught him everything he knows, but he keeps him on, and as they grow up and get to, uh, close to the present, um, you see that somewhere along the line, Paul switched from being his tutor to being his lab assistant. And you really get, you know, from starting it way back when up until the present, you know, you get to see that this is more of a long journey and not just something that happened one day. And you get the sense that these characters have had a long history and you see that what they eventually build up to is more earned because of that. So you get to the point where it's much closer to the framing mechanism, and they're in their lab together, and they've got a big, complicated machine with lots of dials and spinning things, and a glass box full of water, where a dog that unfortunately had passed away is lying, floating in the water. They shoot it full of electricity and chemicals and whatnot. Uh, in this version, they do not raise it up to the sky to get struck by lightning. The uh, Lightning is later repurposed in a pretty interesting way, uh, but I'll save that for when you guys see the movie. Um, but anyway, they drain the water, they look down at the dog, and a few moments later it comes back to life. All in all, if they stopped there, that would have been a very happy movie. Um, if you're going to bring something back to life, why not go for a dog first to get your priorities right? Anyway, um... So they bring the dog back to life. Paul wants to really quickly publish their research because, hey, they might have just found the secret to bringing things back to life. But Dr. Frankenstein says, no, 
I want to do a little more before this information is in the public knowledge. I want to create life from the ground up, from something that was never alive in the first place. So he wants to start his own life. And from there, they go about uh, building their monster. So, well, I mean, they don't intend to build a monster, but building their creature. And they know of a man who has just recently been hanged that they can get the base from. They go and uh, cut him down because he's been left on display. But when they get him back, Frankenstein's examining the body and goes, yeah, it's very good, but head's been pecked away by crows, can't use that. And these hands, look at these, these are, these are criminal hands, you know, they, they need better hands, some, some uh, experienced, you know. So you see with this one, he is uh, trying to build the best version of the creature, you know, not just a creature to bring back to life. With this one, you do get the idea that he is looking for the best body parts. He wants it to be really, really good. And that is a, a cool thing. You know, he wants, like, the eyes of this guy, the hands of that guy. And to see him get really invested in it, it's a really uh, a process for them. And, and during this scene, you do also get to see a little bit of his attitude starting to emerge. And a really cool thing with this movie is the way Peter Cushing portrays Dr. Frankenstein. So he'll, like, you know, get a dead pair of hands and he'll show them to Paul, like, Paul, look at these hands. And Paul's like, that, that's disgusting. You have a dead body's hands. And he's like, oh, come on. He's not going to use them, you know. That idea whenever he's taking an organ, he's like, they're dead. They don't need it. And that really, you know, self-centered, overly logical, and then you do get points later on where you see, okay, he is really self-centered and really just thinking about his mission, you know, where the other times maybe you see Frankenstein has redeeming qualities about him and he just went too far. This one, you know from the beginning, Frankenstein's a pretty evil guy. and He's really wanting to do his quest above all else. But yeah, they put together a monster and uh, along the lines, this really starts to irk Paul. Paul is really not liking how far they're going. And you think he's about to leave, but that's when Hazel Court shows up. Hazel Court is engaged to Dr. Frankenstein. Uh, Paul really does like her, and he sticks around because he doesn't want her getting drugged into this whole mess. So he stays to protect her and, you know... Dr. Frankenstein sees what's going on and uh, uses that to his advantage. Um, so he, uh, Paul is really forced into this way more than he wants to. And you get to see that this movie is about the horrors of science. Now, a lot of versions of Frankenstein, it's about man taking on the role of God. And it's about the father-son relationship between the creature and Dr. Frankenstein. Now, this movie does something different. I mean, this is after uh, 1945 with the, the bomb. This is the point where they say science has sinned. And at this point, you know, science, which had previously been thought of as a pure and good endeavor, it was okay to say, hey, we take it too far sometimes, and science is the real enemy in this movie, science and obsession, and the creature in this doesn't represent Frankenstein's son or the creation of new life necessary. Oh, I mean, it is literally, but I mean, you know. Um, but the monster in this purely rep represents... Uh, scientific obsession and it's cool like I said earlier with the introduction of Paul Hammer is okay with changing something and especially something that big the creature represents scientific obsession rather than the Sun you know and that is a big change you know with Hammer uh, you get a few things as opposed to Universal Hammer's in color 
they're a British stage play feel to them, there's more gore, but also they're willing to really shake things up, and the creature representing something totally different, you know, is a huge risk, but it really does work. It allows the creature to be really evil and not as sympathetic, but it is um, a really cool idea to see the manifestation of one's own ideas. That was really, really cool. Um, but anyway, uh, the creature itself, like I said, most of this movie is about the pursuit of science. One thing that really did strike me is the creature doesn't animate until two-thirds through the movie, and the creature is the climax, not the whole plot, and you really do build to it. Now, you know, you are waiting for it, and I thought, you know, if you had told me that it would take two-thirds of the movie to get to the creature, I'd be like, well, is this going to be boring? Are we going to miss the creature? Uh, but no, seeing that scientific obsession really does give you something to do for out the first two-thirds, and that was really surprising. But, of course, um, when you do get to the creature, that's really where it tears Paul and Victor's relationship apart. And I do have to say the obsession with science, the mad doctor and his best friend bringing things back to life, um, you can see that this film was a clear inspiration for Reanimator later on. And if you want to see a good, gory parody of this film, definitely check out Reanimator. That was a great movie as well. But anyway, the creature, of course, starts to wreak some havoc, and you get to see the, the cool climax there. But that's, I guess, where all the spoiler stuff really hits in, so we won't cover that. But anyway, overall, I tuned in to watch uh, Frankenstein, I had liked all the other Hammer stuff I saw, and I knew I was going to like it. But overall, this really blew me away. I was really happy to see this movie. It does what remakes really should do. Keep the good stuff of the original, but don't be afraid to try something new. And what they tried new really did work, and I was glad that... Um, I was glad that it came out as good as it did. Anyway, um, I'll get to more Hammer soon. I want to review The Mummy uh, up next, so I'll get to that really soon. Anyway, to everyone who's watched so far, thank you for watching. To everyone who's liked and subscribed, thank you. You really are helping the channel out. I do about 95% horror on here, so if that sounds like something you're interested in. I definitely recommend ch uh, sticking around. I'll put a relevant playlist down here at the bottom. Probably be my Hammer playlist. Anyway, I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Have a good day.